introduction. So, uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, this RFFCMCC Navigate webinar, which is actually the 11th one that we've been organizing. So quite, quite a lot uh, during the last two years. And today we're very happy to have um, uh, Lara Alleluia uh, with us, who is a researcher at uh, RFFCMCC in Milan. And she will be speaking on a topic uh, relating health and air pollution and climate policy is uh, a very important and uh, relevant topic, I think. Um, my name is Johannes Emmerling. I'm a researcher at the same institute, RFF CMCC, uh, European Institute on Economics and the Environment, and CMCC in Milan. And just uh, a few minutes about this seminar series and CMCC before then going to the topic. This is a webinar that we also co organized together with the European uh, Horizon project called Navigate which is about developing the next generation of integrated assessment models and applications to support uh, climate policies. It's an ongoing project, has already, um, let's say, spawned a lot of development and improvement in, in, in integrated assessment models, some of which uh, um, has featured also in the recently published IPCC report, among others. And um, it's a pan-European project. Here you can just see the list of partners, and it's basically uh, tries to really improve uh, the understanding and modeling of uh, the systems that we model in these IEMs, looking at energy system, um, demand and supply side, but also on the transformation of uh, society and societal change or, or the, the economic system, especially also. Um, and uh, secondly, it has a focus also on the so-called people dimension, looking at the social impacts of climate policies, uh, the role of social heterogeneity and inequality, and also linking it to impacts um, from climate change, but also other impacts, and these include also health impacts, which is the, the topic of today's webinar, and links to also other, uh, uh, especially social development uh, goals, uh, including health, poverty, but, but also others. So um, I think most of you know it, know it by now, you can, um, ask questions by the by writing in the q a section and i will then present the questions to the speaker uh, after the presentation or you can also then later raise raise your hand and i can give the floor to you if you want to raise your question um, through the video audio connection but now let's move on to to today's topic so as said it's it's about uh, the role of health uh, and and air, especially air pollution impacts and linking to climate policies and climate targets and as said we are very happy to have here lara alleluia who is a researcher and a, and a leading expert in linking uh, air pollution and and health to to iems and to the climate policy evaluation and so therefore i think it's it's great to do to cover these two, uh, two topics in in one talk and uh, a final note, this webinar will also be recorded, so in case you can also listen, find it afterwards on our uh, YouTube channel or on the website. And uh, also here, we have some first information on, on the project and our webinar series. But now, Lara, over to you, and uh, we will see ourselves after your presentation about half an hour for the questions and answers uh, sessions. Can I share my screen? I wish you should be now. Can you see my, my screen? Yes, perfect. So hi everybody. So my name as Johanna said is Lara Leluia Reis. I'll be presenting a study um, that came out, uh, that was out in the Lancet Planetary Health uh, this year, in the beginning of the year. It's called Internalizing Air Pollution, Health and Economic Impacts into Climate Policy. And it's a global modeling study. Uh, I presented this several times in many conferences, I hope. Um, it's not boring. This is the la latest results we could uh, get. And I hope you can still enjoy if you have uh, already heard about uh, this paper. All right, so I'll give a small introduction, so explain a little bit uh, why it's important to, to tackle both uh, of these objectives together, so to tackle both climate and air pollution together, explain a little bit what's the contribution of our paper, given that um, many other authors have also tried to, to, to put these um, two topics together. And then I'll spend some time, a lot of time in the methodology, because I think it's important to understand all the results of the paper. 
speak a little bit about the validation of the models we use and the scenarios we, we, we um, evaluate in this study. Then I'll go through the results in terms of avoided damages, in this case, avoided premature mortality, and the, uh, the effects of these policies into, into, um, in the carbon, on the global carbon price and on welfare. I'll touch a little bit uh, um, on the topic of inequality, and then I'll conclude. All right, so air pollution and climate change, these are two important topics nowadays. We know that air pollution is responsible for millions of deaths worldwide every year. Uh, if you go through the latest database of the HEMA Institute, uh, you will find that in 2019, from all the reported causes of death, one out of nine people died prematurely due to air pollution exposure. So this is a, a big thing. On the other hand, climate change is also responsible for a wide range of impacts, and those impacts include also mortality. Now, both of these issues share at least one origin in common, which is the burning of fossil fuels. And what we are trying to tackle in this paper and what we're looking for here in this paper is that they will also share a common solution, which is a clean and fair um, energy transition. So this is just to show you what was the prediction? So Lili um, Veda in 2015 predicted that uh, by the year 2050, around 6.5 million people would die um, from outdoor pollution uh, due to PM 2.5 and ozone, which are also the pollutants we tackle here. Now, these numbers have already, are already somehow outdated. Now, today, nowadays, in 2050, we have already surpassed that number, but including um, indoor air quality. But we are very close to that number, looking only at air pollution, um, look, looking only at, 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 at air pollution uh, from outdoors, so outdoor air pollution, ambient out, um, air pollution. And this is not only because in some regions of the world, emissions have been raising and others have been declining, but also because we are finding out every day, improving our impact functions, we are finding out that air pollution is responsible for newer diseases. And this, of course, inc increases the burden of air pollution. So air pollution and climate change, they not, not, not always go hand in hand. So there are synergies, as we probably can imagine, but there are also trade-offs. And this, this interaction between air pollution and climate is not always uh, straightforward. So we know that there are some air pollutants that are reflecting aerosols. So when we are trying to tackle air pollution, we are remo removing these, these aerosols from the atmosphere. Well, they were there cooling the atmosphere. So when we implement policies to reduce air pollution and this, this reflecting the aerosols are reduced due to these policies, we may cause warming. This effect is known to not be very high, very big, but is for sure not neg negligible. So this is a trade-off clearly. And then we have two channels to reduce air pollution. One is to implement end of pipe technology. These are end of that these end of pipe technology are technology that you place at the end of the production line. So you do not switch any fuel, you do not change the efficient of a machine or of a given technology, you basically only preventing pollutants to go out uh, in the atmosphere. This is the example, for example, of scrubbers, cyclones, filters, electrostatic precipitators, this type of technology is what we mean when we talk about um, end of pipe. The other way to reduce air pollution is via structural measures, like changing the energy system, switching fuels, switching to more efficient technologies. Now, this type of changes reduces not only air pollution, but also greenhouse gases. So what we're trying to find here in this paper is the right balance between these two, these two types of, of measures. Now, air pollution and climate change, they also differ in many other aspects. For example, they have a very different temporal uh, and spatial scales. When we look at air pollutants, normally most of air pollutants have a lifetime of days, uh, some even less than days. Uh, they can be washed out by, wet precip uh, by precipitation via wet, um, uh, wet deposition. Whereas climate uh, greenhouse gases, they can live up into the atmosphere CO2, for example, can be in the atmosphere for 100 years. So it's incredibly well mixed. And it doesn't really matter because it's so well mixed. It lives so long in the atmosphere. It doesn't really matter where you reduce it. Whereas air pollutants are, are very different. It really matters where you, where you reduce these, um, these emissions. Oh, the, the, the emissions will ultimately lead to concentrations, which are very dependent on many other factors, such as meteorolo meteorological factors and also geographical and topological um, effects. For example, here in Milan, 
uh, where our institute is based, uh, emitting uh, some uh, air emitting a ton of black carbon in Milan is not the same as emitting a ton of black carbon in Paris because we have a situation where the Alps are trapping the air here, and so pollutants tend to accumulate, and this provokes uh, very uh, very high uh, concentrations, and therefore. The, the, the policies that you would need to tackle climate and air pollution, they have synergies, as for example, the example of structural measures, but they may also have trade-offs as if you're implementing um, end of pipe, you're reducing air pollutants, you may increase warming and this has consequences. So let's go through it. So what we do in this paper is that we do an optimal cost benefit analysis of air pollution. So generically, when we think about cost benefit, we, we think about quantificating um, quant quantifying, sorry, the economic costs and put confront them against the economic benefits. Now here, what we're doing is slightly different. We are trying to balance the pollution abatement costs with the avoided uh, impacts, um, with the avoided impacts from reduced mortality. Okay, we also include crop losses, but I will be speaking mostly about mortality in this paper because it's what we found that drives mostly the results. It's what what is most important for for the results of this study. So here in this study, what we do is that we try to compute global optimal co uh, cost benefit policies in the context of the Paris Agreement. So there have been many studies. I mean, there's more than the ones I've put here. These were some of the studies that have um, inspired us, but there's many more and they are not listed all there just for uh, because of my laziness. So, uh, but you will find many more. Um, all of them try to tackle the same problem as we do here, but not, none of them does all together as we try to do here. So that's our contribution. So let's let me try to convince that our study is slightly <laughs> innovative. So here in this case, what we do is that we use the detailed energy system model, which is the which model. It's an integrated assessment model, which has somehow a rich set of mitigation technology options, um, and it it has um, regional optimal uh, policy. It, it it basically it optimizes um, the. It, it, it provides a solution, an optimal solution for each region of the, of the model. We also have uh, marginal abatement costs rather than total ab abatement costs. That is, we don't look at total cost of a policy and total benefit of a policy. We, look, we balance marginal costs of the policy with uh, marginal benefit of the policy. So this means it's a global optimization uh, cost benefit analysis and not um, uh, a standard cost benefit analysis. We use uh, the air pollution impacts from FAST. Many other studies also do this. We include ozone in PM 2.5 um, with many causes of premature mortality. Here, we don't use the latest GDB um, impact functions. Uh, so if, we want, if you want our studies more on the conservative side uh, with respect to the new uh, GDB impact functions, which predict much higher mortalities. Uh, we include the impact of aerosol forcing by using the magic C model. So here we cannot use as normally is currently very used in an in integrated assessment model for climate, which is carbon budgets. We have to use temperature or radiative forcing because if we are to use carbon budgets, we cannot uh, account for the trade-off between the reflecting aerosols, the removal of the reflecting aerosols in the increase in temperature. So in order to get our temperature right, because we are taking away cooling agents that were there in the atmosphere, cooling the masking the effect of warming we have to use magic C and we have to use temperature and not a carbon budget and then the other thing that is I hope and I think innovative in these studies that we include endogenous end of pipe control measures via cost abatement curves that we implement from gains so let's let's go through the methodology now how we do this so everything is the all the decisions are taking and everything goes around the, the, the which model, which is an integrated assessment model, as I said. So basically, the policymaker of each region is trying to supply the demand for energy and has, um, has, to, has to supply the demand for energy. So in order to supply this demand for energy, it has to have energy activities, right? Which are this A that you see here. So these activities, they emit, they emit both greenhouse gases but they also emit air pollution, uh, air, pollutant, uh, air pollutants. So these air pollutants are given to FAST, which is an air pollutant, uh, uh, let's say an air quality model that takes emissions, transforms them. It, it's a source receptor model. So it uses source receptor matrices to transform emissions into concentrations and then calculates mortality, all right? 
So now we have mortality from the activities of a given region in the witch model. Now what we do is that we give, we assign this mortality an economic value. We use this, that we use the VSL, so the value per statistical life. And so now, and we give this back to the economy, to the witch model as a cost, an impact cost of air pollution. So now basically the policymaker in which knows that emissions uh, and his activities emit and emit and they kill. So his activities are costing him money. The, it, he, he was completely blind to that before. He didn't know that pollution was killing people and therefore it was costing him money. Now he knows. So we calculate mortality, we give an economic value and we give this information to the policymaker. So now he has a cost, the cost of air pollution impact. So he needs to do something. He needs to do something to mitigate this cost because what he wants is to optimize the welfare and maximize the welfare of his region. So he has two options, sorry. One option is the one that you normally, you normally have in these models, which is to change the structure of the energy system, switch fuels, try to lower um, these emissions. The other option he has is to go to invest in end of pipe. So what we do is that we take the gains uh, model and we calculate linear marginal abatement costs. And we preload this cost, this um, marginal abatement, uh, marginal cost curves into which, and we give the policymaker the, the option that if he wants, through a certain cost of abatement, he can abate his air pollution emissions with end of pipe. And so what the model will do ultimately is try to balance what is best between end of pipe and structural measures. It will do this mainly when there is a climate uh, target, right? If there's no climate target, probably having in mind that end of cost measures are slightly, are generally less cost, uh, less costly than structural measures, you will, lose, you, will, you will use all this the end of pipe you can. But because he has this other objective, he also needs to uh, fill in a climate target. So basically, as we, as I said before, the activities they emit air pollutants, but they also emit greenhouse gases. So we give both the air pollutant emissions and the greenhouse gas emissions to the MAGIC-C model, which tell us, tells us if our temperature is under the target we want, under or equal the target we want or not. And this is done for each region. And there's a whole cycle of iteration that occurs until the temperature target is met and un until the welfare of each region has been optimized. So as you see here, in a way, instead of the typical co-benefits, what we're doing is trying to optimize co-benefits. So basically, the policymaker is going to try to find the right balance between um, the co-benefits he gets from, from uh, air pollution and, and, uh, and uh, climate and uh, what he can achieve uh, in terms of welfare just by reducing um, air pollution emissions with end of pipe. Now, as I said here, we use this uh, FAST. Um, FAST is a FAST model but it's not fast enough to be included in an optimization routine. So what we do is we built an emulation for fast. We use lasso regression. So basically we want only the predictors that uh, can predict very well our level of concentration and therefore mortality and crop loss. And so we, we do this by running 500 runs, um, 500 runs of the faster model with the five, uh, 500 scenarios. We use the SSPRCP database. And what you see here is the results of the emulator. We are very confident it was a good um, emulator because if you look here, so this is a Taylor diagram. The best model would be the one that lies here on the, on the X axis on the, on the dot, on the black dot. So premature mortality is the, the gray dot that you see. So basically we are above an R of 0 0.9. If you see here, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we are above this line. So this is a correlation of 0 0.9. So we have higher correlation than 0 0.9. And we have an error, which is the circles here, that is lower uh, than 0 0.5. So we are quite close of this uh, optimal uh, dot. So we are very confident that our emulator can emulate very well the results of, of FAST. This is also just to compare with other studies. This is what uh, the results of our model is a bit of a spoiler but uh, we see that our model compares very well with the more conservative studies. The, more, uh, the less conservative studies, the more updated ones that have all these new diseases, uh, they are way less conservative. Uh, but we know that our impact functions are from this family here, and therefore we are confident again that our emulator works quite well, um, and that's why we can use it. Now, how do we include the impact costs 
into the model. Uh, as I explained before, we include this through the VSLs, the value per statistical life, all right? And this value is not equal for every region. So we do not assume that every region values the way, the very values improved health the same way. This is done through this equation here that you see that includes uh, income, um, income per capita in PPP. And this assumes a, a VSL elasticity of one. As you will see throughout the paper, we also do sensitivity on this uh, elasticity. Now, a little bit on the scenarios we did. We did a lot of scenarios. So what we do is that we run the five SSP baselines. SSP are the um, shared socioeconomic scenarios. And it's important here, and they vary in their socioeconomic assumptions. So they vary according to GDP and population. But most importantly for this study, they vary in terms of what you assumed as already implied end of pipe control. So as already control measures. So for example, SSP1 and SSP5 assume that the world will be very clean. So we will deploy best available technologies for end of pipe right away. And we will converge all, uh, all of the regions will, of the world will soon converge to also this maximum feasible reduction um, from end of pipe. Whereas SSP4 and SSP3 are the reverse. So there is improvement that, that happens, but this improvement is not close in, for every region to the best available technologies. So what we are doing here is that we're testing um, what is the effect of internalizing air pollution damages, even when you have different assumptions of what your underlying air pollution will be on the baseline, okay? And SSP2 is the middle of the road. So it's not as bad as SSP3 and SSP4, but it's not as good as SSP1 and SSP5. So we use these five um, baselines and then we apply two temperature targets. So we have baseline. So basically there's no climate policy. There's only, there may be or maybe not um, um, internalizing of air pollution damages. And then we use two degrees and 1.5 degrees. We also um, have a look at what happens if we delay policy. So when we delay climate policy, what happens to the investments in air quality? And we, I will show you results about this. And we also change a little bit and do sensitivity on the way we value improved health. So let's go to the results right away. So here, what we see is the premature mortality estimated, a premature death um, up to the year 2050. The range that you see there are the different SSPs, okay? And this, is, this range is what you can get just by varying the baseline of air pollution assumptions of GDP and uh, population. So this is the range that you can get just by changing the socioeconomic assumptions of the SSPs. Now, what we normally see in literature is the yellow uh, shaded here, which is climate policy. So these are the co-benefits of climate policy. What happened when to these SSPs, we apply a certain climate policy. And indeed, we can reduce, um, we can reduce air pollution mortality and there's co-benefits for, for, this is not new in literature. We, this is already um, known. But what, what is, in what is the most new here is what happens when we internalize air pollution damages. So if the policymaker knows that polluting is costing him money, this is what he will do. So if, if you see there, this is the blue, the blue lines over there. We have air pollution uh, internalization of damages with and without climate policy on the blue ones. But you see that once the policymaker knows that his activities are killing people via, via air pollution, is forced to act and therefore it will reduce and it will really bend um, the curve of premature mortality um, from air pollution and it will really act on it. So this is basically our main result. We find that air pollution can be reduced. Um, it can reduce up to 1.6 million people in the year 2050. And this is three times higher than the co-benefits of climate change. So it's three times more than you would get from the co-benefits of climate change. This is just by including the health dimension into the decision. Now, this is what happens to, uh, to the regional effect. So what we see, where are these people saved? Where are we avoiding this, this, uh, this mortality? Most of it is, of course, China and India, but we also see um, a big share of it coming from the reforming economies, Russia, and the, the former Soviet uh, Union economies. And this is cumulative uh, throughout the years for SSP2. Now, as I told you, we did sensitivity on VSL. So we, we run the same scenarios, but with different ways of valuing 
um, the value per statistic of life. So we assume that people value improved health in a different way. What we find is that for optimal air pollution, this, this has a big impact in when you when you calculate total uh, cost benefit analysis, because it's just a multiplying factor. But when you calculate marginal cost and marginal uh, um, benefit, this has less impact. So there is indeed, of course, an impact from the VSL that you assume, but this impact is way less is way less than, for example, your assumptions on the baseline on the the, the SSP baselines. So we get mu much more variation just by changing the underlying air pollution GDP and population than by changing the VSL. Here is uh, the sensitivity, the elasticity. As I showed you before, we assume in our most of our runs that the uh, VSL has an elasticity of one. If you uh, if you are to change this elasticity, you can see that this the sensitivity to the global results is not very high. But uh, here I'm not analyzing, and I this is the the step that I want to do next is to analyze regionally. So globally, we don't see a big effect, but regionally, for sure, this will make a big effect when you change um, the elasticity, uh, the income elasticity to VSL. And this is for me is one of the, the, the future research and also for anybody listening who wants to, to do that. I think it's a very uh, interesting way of, uh, of looking on how do, because it's very uh, polemic on how would one estimate that other people will, of course, uh, value the improved health uh, due to air pollution and how this may change their local policies. This is very important. So at the global level, we don't see a big change, but at regional level, I, I think uh, um, big changes may, may appear. Now, looking at the impacts um, of climate policy in only when we look only at uh, um, air pollution internalization, so only at cost benefit analysis. And of course, uh, um, again, this reduces the, so the more stringent is your climate policy, the, the less um, is your your uh, your premature mortality pathway is, is is reduced, and also you reduce the range of possible bad outcomes um, from uh, from uh, from air pollution. So indeed, uh, not it's not just the internalization of the of air pollution damages that makes a, a difference, but also the fact that I also have to meet a certain temperature target at the end of the century. Now looking at the other way around, so we've always looked at how can carbon um, uh, climate policies help um, air pollution policies? Here, what I'm trying to do is, can air pollution policies help uh, decarbonization in climate policies? What I see is that it does not give a very big help. So if you look at the, mainly at the red and the blue line up there, which are the ones that don't include the carbon, tar uh, carbon tar um, a temperature target, you see that the, most of the co-benefits happen for CH4. CH4, a methane, is not only uh, a carbon, um, sorry, a greenhouse gas, but is also uh, an air pollutant because me, uh, CH4 uh, um, produces ozone. So it's one of the precursors of ozone. And therefore, we see a big synergy here because, of course, we are reducing both air pollution uh, and greenhouse gases. And this, uh, this is a big uh, co-benefit here. Um, and this also reduces a little bit the temperature, but we see that this effect is very, very little uh, and reduces a little bit the CO2 as well, but the effect is very little. So air pollution, uh, so climate change help, uh, policies for climate change help a lot uh, air pollution policies, but air pollution policies, on the other hand, may not be uh, what we need for, for climate. So climate needs a bigger, a bigger push, so they won't be a big uh, game changer in, in the climate policy system. Now, what happens when you delay policy? Well, when you delay policy, if you look here, mainly panel B, the difference from uh, internalizing air pollution and having only a temperature target, so for example, in the two de degrees, but also you can also see in the 1.5 degrees, is that if we delay climate policy, then it's really important to internalize the, the, the air pollution impact. Because if we're not decarboniz decarbonizing right away in the beginning of this decade, then if we don't put the health dimension in, um, in the, if we don't include this in the decision, we may, we, there are around 1 million lives that we could have avoided that, that we are not avoiding. Uh, and this, uh, this is one major, um, one major outcome of this paper as well, is that we should be implementing this end of pipe right away, because, uh, and especially if we see that decarbonization is being delayed, then this should really be done 
um, because this helps, of course, avoiding a lot of premature mortality. Now, looking at trade-offs, so as you see, this, these graphs here are shown only for the year 2000, uh, 2100. So as we see, we increase forcing uh, by, re by removing aerosols from the atmosphere because, of course, we are doing policy. So we are doing air pollution policy, so we are taking out aerosols. But then, as you also see, this needs to be compensated by CO2 reductions. Now, this does not come for free, okay? So the, the compensation is very little. I will explain also, try to explain also why this happens and this compensation is little, but it needs to happen. So you remove one, uh, one forcing agent, um, one uh, agent that was, that was uh, removing, that was cooling the earth, you have to compensate and reduce more the one that was, uh, that was actually warming the earth. And this is called the, the, the carbon penalty. This is um, the, the extra carbon you have to reduce because you're tackling air pollution. And this may have implications on the carbon price. So one of the things that is nice here is that what we see, well, normally we look on only at SSP2. If we were to do that, because it's the middle of the road scenario, we would say, okay, internalizing air pollution impacts, decreases carbon price, global carbon prices. Also, this would be the case also in SSP1. But if we look at SSP3 and SSP5, this is not the case at all. Carbon price is increased when um, we internalize air pollution impacts. And if we look at uh, SSP4, this is even more complicated because depending on the carbon target, the, 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 the carbon price may increase or decrease. So I don't wanna go a lot into detail on this. So I'm skipping this for the sake of time, but the reason for this is here. So if you look here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you look up on the right side of the, um, of the slide, in terms of climate change mitigation, the, the order of the SSPs goes this way. So SSP1 to SSP5, whereas for air pollution is, is not the same order. So SSP1 is the cleanest and SSP3 is the, um, the dirtiest. So when you're trying to optimize both together, what happens is that you don't have uh, uh, a very linear, easy effect on carbon price. So basically this happens and going back to this result. So when the extra decarbonization due to aerosol reduction leads to greater aerosol reductions, that is, uh, I have to decarbonize and because I decarbonize, I reduce even more air pollutants. Then what I'm doing is that I'm entering a positive reinforcement cycle and I'm increasing the carbon price. And this is the case of very, very polluted uh, baselines. This may also happen when the system is already very green and the climate target is very stringent as the case of SSP5, for example. And so there are very few carbon left in the system and in order to, the extra decarbonization is, uh, is gonna be measures that are really, really costly. And therefore carbon price is again increased. Or, and this is the case of SSP4, which is the most complicated to explain is that when extra decarbonization that is needed is not being done in the countries where air pollution mitigation are most, uh, are mostly needed. So when this happens, they, because they, they have different spatial uh, problems, uh, we see a mis misalignment between climate policies and air quality policies. And what happens is that this car causes a distortion in the carbon price and the carbon price may increase. Especially this is the case of SSP4 because it's a very fragmented world. And so if the carbonization is done in regions like MENA, and this is not the regions that would save more people in terms of air pollution, then you increase the carbon price. You may end up increasing the carbon price. Uh, for the sake of time, I will also, this is the, what happens in end of pipe. So end of pipe increases is, is very high. Investments in end of pipe is very high at the beginning of the century. This is not only because at the beginning of the century, less end of pipe is already deployed, but also because it's, um, because air, pollution, air pollutants are short-lived. Huh? decarbonizing at the beginning of the century won't affect a lot uh, my climate target at the end of the century. Because remember, I set my cli climate target as the temperature at the end of the century. So if I'm reducing aerosols now, a lot of aerosols now, I'm causing a little bit of warming now, but I really don't care because my target is at the end of the century. So this may have maybe a problem in terms of triggering um, um, what they're called, uh, three green tipping, climate tipping points. But if we set our um, objective as the end of the century, there is a trade-off that is done there. Now, looking at regional impact and welfare, we see that 
internalizing air pollution uh, damages into the decision always increases welfare, always. All the points are up to the above the, the, the one line. So uh, globally, welfare is always increased. So basically what I'm saying is that despite all these trade-offs that we try to account for, um, solving air, the air pollution issue in no by no means jeopardizes the climate the climate uh, the fight against climate change if anything is that despite all these trade-offs we still should be tackling air pollution and we still could still achieve uh, the climate targets i looked also at inequality here um when i say inequality i looked between country inequality and not within country inequality. So I'm not looking at uh, within country des income deciles or, or quantiles or quartiles. I'm looking within country inequality and what we see is that inequality is always reduced, okay? There is not a big reduction, but that is always reduced. So global and regional welfare increases when air pollution impacts are internalized and this has no negative repercussions on global um, inequality. So just to conclude, and I hope you're not all asleep by now, Welfare maximizing policies that take into account the, the health dimension, so the, 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 um, the damages from air pollution, they can reduce um, premature mortality in 2050 by uh, 1.6 million deaths annually by 2050. And this is three times uh, what we find the co-benefits uh, that, that are the co-benefits for climate policy. This is robust across the choice of our VSL. We also find that SSPs have a large influence on premature death and can also influence car global carbon prices. And that um, internalizing air pollution damages alone has very little impact on, on the carbonization. Thank you very much. I hope this was um, interesting and uh, that you had fun. Great, yes. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lara, for a very very broad and, and yet concise uh, talk on, on many angles and a lot of uh, dimensions that are that are interlinked and that's I think the important part here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, let's uh, uh, sack this <laughs> lot of detail in for a minute maybe and yeah, as uh, I see, I mean, people are, everyone is still here actually, so uh, great. And yeah, you just can type your question if you have any or suggestion comments in, in the chat, in the Q&A uh, button, sorry and uh, or in case raise your hand if you have a let's say more complicated question you want to uh, address personally i start with two questions that i uh, that i already have seen um one is uh, on the fast r model that that now you used um the question is is it a lagrangian or a eulerian model? model yeah so it's a source receptive matrix uh, model that comes from tm5 tm5 is if i'm not mistaken a eulerian model so it's not a lagrangian model but it's a source receptor matrix so the model in itself it's an emulator of the eulerian model okay uh, but if you want to look uh, it's the tm5 model so it comes from tm5 and i'm happy uh, there's also this this uh, the, the fast uh, paper has been published um, two years ago and i'm also happy to to give that reference uh, if you want to look. But it's run with the TM5, which is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, an Eulerian model. I'm almost sure it's an Eulerian model because it includes a lot of chemistry behind. Exactly, yeah, that's the, what's the question, whether it takes into account all these reactions in the atmosphere. Yes, so it takes then... into account secondary aerosol formation, uh, the interaction between precursors, meteorology. The problem is that we use a fixed meteorology, some kind of typical meteorology, because we don't have a changing meteorology. It's good in one sense that all the changes we get in mortality here will be attributed to uh, the changes in emissions and not changing in meteorology. But it's bad in the sense that meteorology is of course constantly changing and this may provoke variations in, in the annual uh, um, mortality, um, avoided mortality. I hope it was clear. Yes, I think. And the, the final question of uh, Maurizio on this is the, the grid resolution of the model. Um, so TM5, I don't know. I think it's the same as fast, which is 0 0.1 degrees. But again, and um, I, I can, I mean, happy to, then you please uh, send me an email if I don't answer this. So fast, again, it's one, 0 0.1, but it's again a source receptor matrix. So only countries or regions in, uh, in that grid that have been per perturbed, we will be affected. And I can explain later how this happens. Um, 
but it's 0 0.1 degrees, uh, the calculation of chemistry, but not the calculation of the perturbation. But uh, I can explain this later if uh, it's needed. Okay, I think, yeah, yeah, it's easy to find your contact details in case. Great. Um, okay, uh, another uh, two, two or three questions. Uh, one by Carla on, yeah, how can these these findings be brought to the decision makers or how, we, um, yeah, well, that's of course a, an important question, general question, but yeah, how to bring these that's findings a, into, yeah, to, to yeah, the relevant decision Yeah, that's a tough one. Makers. That's um, the question that we all do uh, in our work. I think the main the main point here is, I, for me, there are two main points. Uh, one main point is that we should be including the mentioned in our policies. Can you change? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Got, just got even louder somehow, but it's okay. It's okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Now it's back. Sorry now. for I'm lost you for a moment there. So we should be taking into account for the health dimension in our policy. So whenever we do a policy we should uh, account for the health dimension for sure. Otherwise, there's a lot of things that policymakers are blind to and they don't see these extra costs coming at them. And therefore, and therefore many policies may fail. So th this is for me, the high level uh, answer. The other thing is that comes out at least from our results is that um, we should be implementing end of pipe measures right away, right away, uh, in, uh, regardless of whether, uh, climate will unfold, uh, this should be, impl be implemented right away, and especially in regions where this will have huge marginal um, abatement, uh, could uh, have huge marginal avoided mortality uh, just by implementing a few um, millions on end of pipe measures. Uh, so for me, these are the two main policy me messages that are easy somehow to translate into concrete policy. I hope I was, uh, I'm up to. Yeah. No, no. One I last, think... if I may, one last would be for me as well is to choose policies that have that maximize co benefits. That is, if we think back always on that case, the case of biomass and biofuels, right? Biofuels and biomass are very va va valuable option in terms of climate change, but they may provoke problems in terms of air pollution. And so, it's it's what this framework is trying to do is trying to avoid this type of problems, trying to fall into this type of lock-ins that then maybe create, you're trying, maybe basically you're trying to avoid the law of, a, of unintended consequences. So if you choose technology and if you go for policies that are designed to maximize co-benefits, then you, at least you're trying to minimize the risk of falling into a lock-in of a technology that is not, uh, that may create a, an externality. I hope. <laughs> yeah no i think these are all good entry points excellent actually on this also so maybe another question also by carla is about how um lower mortality um low mortality i assume you mean maybe baseline mortality is taken into account in because that's probably related to increasing ghg greenhouse gas emissions in the future how lower mortality um yeah how this the, the correlation between the two is taken into account in the model. I assume, meaning baseline mortality may be going down, for instance. Sorry, can you? I didn't understand the question. Well, I can read the question. To what extent do the calculations also take into account the presumably increasing GHG in the case of lower mortality? But, uh, Carla, in case you might also uh, ask it. Um, uh, I think she's asking if we take into account the damages from, air, from climate. On, on, on mortality? Is this the question? If this is the question, we don't. And this is a drawback and uh, whoever is listening and wants to do better, uh, please be invited to do so. Uh, we don't take into account the climate damages in this study. There's many reasons, uh, practical and feasible modeling the reasons why we don't do it. Um, one is because of the optimization. We would have one optimization that is at the global level and one optimization that is at the local level. And this is very hard to conciliate. But what we do is, and that's why we use two uh, climate temperature targets, is try to account somehow for what would be the um, what would be the, the sensitivity to this climate damage. So we reach 1.5 or we reach two degrees because we know there will be major damages. 
And therefore, we do this in order to avoid these damages, but we don't quantify uh, the damages that are avoided from greenhouse gases. If this was the question, which I hope it was, mm -hmm. and I hope I have understood. I think so, yes. Uh, yeah. And she also writes here that, uh, for instance, especially in Germany, there's this Klimawandel and Gesundheit. I mean, Lada speaks German, so she understands the website that you might have a look at, uh, we say, with, that okay. are exactly working on this issue in terms of uh, also um, policy and outreach uh, contact points. Okay. And uh, yeah, actually another point also on, on the level of uh, how that is relevant for policymakers and how to, let's say, make these findings most accessible and, and relevant for policymakers in terms of uh, the EU level, how um, how detailed can the, these results be, let's say, um, looked at a more local level to, to especially inform EU countries or even local entities you mentioned, uh, Milad, at the beginning. So the question is, yeah, how these global findings can be trickled down and brought down to the local level or how uh, do you have any uh, studies? Yeah, that, on? That's a very good question. So as I said, this is based on this model that the which model, which is a global model. So basically, you could implement the same framework uh, uh, using a, an European model or, or an European style model uh, as well that uh, that has optimization, and preferably that has a perfect foresight uh, style optimization. Uh, so it depends on your underlying model. Basically, if you have a model that has detailed the granularity, detail of the uh, European uh, countries or regions or even not uh, European regions, this would be great. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, probably with gains, you could do something similar uh, with the gains type model, uh, these kind of things. But in theory, the best would be to have, uh, again, a detailed European, uh, European model. Um, basically, it all relies on if you have data and if you have these specifications, then of course, it. Uh, this framework could be implemented uh, in any type of, um, of model. Uh, you only need the data. Um, yeah, very useful, I think, also at the local level. Um, another question, yeah, again, and also Carla, is if there's like a summary or an extended um, abstract or the, 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 for policymakers that of this work that can be shared, for instance, with the decision maker, that would be useful in case you can share it or uh, post it, yeah. I didn't do this. Maybe I'm, if I do it, uh, I, I will share for sure. But uh, uh, there is a high level conversation, a podcast on, uh, on uh, the resources radio, resources radio, which is a podcast of resources for the future. Um, and I didn't do any policy brief. Maybe I could do that. Uh, it's uh, nice. I'll take that invitation <laughs> and try to share it then. Okay, great. And um, okay, we have other question, one more on the variables of traceability of information. What degree of reliability of this modeling? Um, I think that's a general question to models, of course, on the, the data and uh, information that goes into the models that you described. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, doing this type of modeling, um, um, implies a lot of assumptions uh, and implies taking a lot of data from some other models that themselves have made some assumptions. So what we do here is basically we use the which model, which has already um, an open source version and gains model, which is also uh, the results of the gains model are also open. Uh, and we are clear about uh, what is the VSL uh, that we use and the elasticity and so on. But it's true. Um, I don't know if the author was asking for the, the results in itself or the data that comes in. The data that we used are all publicly available um, somewhere. Uh, the gains model, for example, is the data that we use for costs, uh, vendor pipe, and uh, the data from which is, uh, is in the which open source uh, available. Um, and FAST is also an available uh, open source model. Um, and Magic C, I don't know if Magic C is open source. Uh, but I think Magic C is available as well, at least upon request. So everything is open source. So we try to increase, increase transferability, and try, try to decrease number of uh, possible bugs and errors. But uh, again, uh, when you use a model that has so many, um, that, let's say, uses so many models and so many data and so many, uh, again, you have to use data that uh, was themselves based on uh, uh, maybe some assumptions in all these kind of things. So for sure, 
but what's important here is also the dynamics of what what you what happens when you include or not include these damages what what happens between even when you do sensitivity on the price and the cost of end of pipe what happens is the model always tries to go to this in this direction and so on in this in this case from what the tests we could done and that's also why we run so many uh, SSP bases and VSL assumptions and the VSL elasticity assumptions and um, and also uh, we, we run also some elasticity on the possibility of end of pipe and the results come back to this result the robust result that still the policymaker would still act a lot and would still invest a lot in end of pipe just to reduce uh, mortality so basically this these assumptions are robust and what we mm -hmm. find is robust across many assumptions of course there's always others we could try to test i agree <laughs> you could oh i think it's a very good answer more. of course one can only do a finite uh, set of things uh, going to one of these special uh, specific uh, robustness cases, you did uh, another question, excellent presentation about the, um, the VSL, especially how to adjust it with, with increasing incomes across countries, but also with increasing incomes over time, as you know, I mean, in a lot of countries, uh, growth is expected. And also into potentially discounting, I mean, how does discounting or future events or extreme events yeah, play a role on... This is the, the paper I would like to do next. And I think this is an excellent question because myself uh, doing this, uh, and that's why we did so many sensitivity on VSL because uh, indeed it may be, we didn't find a huge global effect, but indeed uh, this is a relevant question. So uh, uh, the extrapolation of VSL, both in time and in space, I mean, across regions and countries, it, it is, um, a very important question for everybody who does uh, cost benefit analysis and also an optimal cost benefit analysis, as I show here, it doesn't seem to be as important, but it still is important. And I think this is the main question. And uh, I think what I would like to do is to do this kind of sensitivity to, to and uh, Johannes, I yeah, maybe I should do it with you. And we, we, we use different discount ways of discounting the VSL and different ways of extrapolating it regionally. For sure, this is a, this is a big question and yeah, it's a very interesting one. I, I hope uh, this will be one of the next uh, papers we, we can do. Yes, I agree. I mean, that's both from an applied perspective for the results that you showed, but also of course from a conceptual perspective as uh, the question by by, um, by Stefan was, was raised is very important. So uh, yeah, something to uh, for further work for sure also in, in the future. Okay, yeah, so and, and a final question, yeah, uh, a comprehensive summary uh, was again would be very, very appreciated also by <laughs> my email if you can send it. Um, yeah, I think it will we will also we can post it in the in the YouTube um, video uh, that should be easily accessible. Anyway, I think, yeah, well, thanks a lot also, Lada, for, for answering this uh, broad set of questions in many directions, from application to the concepts and the very scientific and economic background of, uh, of a very relevant topic. And um, I think, yeah, if there's no further question, well, thanks also for everyone joining and, uh, and asking questions. And it's always great to, to ex exchange and engage with uh, all different kinds of, uh, of people working in different fields or being interested in different fields from research to NGOs, uh, government, local entities and, and, and the private sector. So yeah, thanks, thanks again and hope to see you soon on another, another CMCC or, or Navigate webinar. Um, you find, uh, well, there, there's a mailing list where you probably registered, um, so you will get updated about future ones. And with that being said, thank you very much. And thanks especially to Lara for uh, sharing her, her great paper with us today and uh, see you next time. And I wish you all a nice afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. Thanks.